Does everything really need to be decentralized? All these concepts in Web3 and blockchain give us new abilities so we can remove the middleman and we can start thinking more about ownership and decentralization. And it's borrowing old concepts that's applying them to Web3. Let's not drive our car in the rear view mirror. Let's be proactive. And now it's just about continually adding value to the community. People need to challenge traditional thinking. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Next Billion podcast, where we're talking to the builders, the entrepreneurs, people that are onboarding the next billion people into crypto. And you know, what? I was just talking before with our guest about Web3 recently and all of the cool things that are happening in the Web3 world. And we were thinking particularly of our friends at Star Atlas. And then I was thinking, who can I talk to that's immersed in the Star Atlas world? And, and that's who our guest is today. Uh, Stardust, you may know him. Uh, Stardust Economy, I believe is the, the website. And it's all about Star Atlas data analytics and and Stardust is a, is a guy who, uh, well, I'll let him introduce himself, but uh, really is symbolizing that whole builder mentality of you just, you see a, so you see an opportunity and then you just get out there and do it yourself. So I'm, uh, I'm super happy to have you on the podcast today, Stardust. So thanks for coming along. Yeah. Thanks, George. It's great to be here. And um, yeah, love what you guys are doing with the podcast. I've been keeping up to date with um, all your other episodes. So it's just, yeah, a real delight to be here with you. Absolutely. Well, that's good to hear. And I'm really excited to get into some of the, the Web3 and Star Atlas side of things. And, and also, I know you're, you're starting a, a, an academy soon. But uh, before we get into that, maybe for those who don't know, what's been your journey thus far in crypto? How did you get into this crazy world of crypto and coins and NFTs and Solana and, and blah, blah, blah? What's, what's the arc been so far? Yeah, good question. Um, I think like so many of us out there, feeling disgruntled with the traditional financial world. This would have been, you know, 2013, 2014, really just looking for something different. I was working a lot in the IoT space, Internet of Things, and I was over in Perth living in Western Australia. And there are a few really cool projects starting up over there, like Power Ledger, which were... Oh, yeah, I remember them. Creating, yeah, creating like P2P energy trading smart contracts and new and interesting ways of using like blockchain technology to create more of a decentralized uh, world. And that's what really got me into it, this idea that, you know, we can remove the middleman, we can build decentralized applications, we can start pushing data out to the edge, and we can start thinking more about ownership and decentralization. And I started running a few seminars, just kind of teaching people about Bitcoin and Ethereum and smart contracts, and then kind of just kept on the journey and was always interested in new things. And obviously Solana came out and I was just obsessed with, you know, the transactions per second and, you know, just kept learning and kept reading and kept building my network. So I've kind of been on the journey since 2013, 14 and haven't stopped since. I love it. Oh, wow. That's pretty OG, you know, back then, 2013, 2014, you know, that's uh, that's back in the day. That's where I would classify, you know, time periods. People like talk about the the Pleistocene epoch or something. It's like there's back in the day and then there's now in crypto. That's all there is. So, you know, yeah, that's, uh, 100%. 100%. That's, uh, that's cool to hear. So, so you sort of got into it from the perspective of new and, and interesting systems that were maybe like, I guess, giving people power of, of what they're doing more so than some corporate overlord, something like that. That's sort of one of the philosophies that, that brought you in on it? Yeah, I think it was that. And obviously working as a data scientist, this idea that we don't have to rely on centralized systems. So the computer science side of it really got me interested. You know, this idea that we can set up nodes and, you know, we can create RPCs and you know, all these concepts in Web3 and blockchain that sort of change the whole computing space and give us new abilities as computer scientists to harness more of the P2P type applications and decentralized applications. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that always annoys me of sort of normie world is so many people rely on these financial metrics that are just closed boxes. So it's like inflation is a classic example, right? It's like, can I see the formula? Like, is it open source? Can I see the data sets, please? No, I can't. It doesn't exist. No <laughs> one will tell you. It's just like, it's just some guy who comes out and just tells you what the number is. It's like, and they just go, oh yeah, we look at like just some generalized thing. It's like, bro, 
the data set for that is not real time. It's not updated, you know, like job numbers and that sort of thing. I've worked many jobs in the past. My employer is not submitting anything to anyone about, you know, I just got a job or I remember my first job stacking shelves and stuff like that. Like, you know, so how do they collect this data? Nobody knows. So I guess, yeah, the Web3 world, like it's such a rich environment for people that care about data. And, and as you mentioned, like as a data scientist, like the whole thing revolves around data. Literally every transaction to ever exist is there on the ledger. You can't fake it. It's, it's amazing. So that's a really cool sort of, you know, way to approach it. But I guess, how did you get into the Star Atlas side of things as well? So you've gone through the journey of uh, smart contracts and crypto and evangelizing that to people. And then what happens? You're like, hey, what's this uh, spaceship game going on? Yeah, I know. So my mate came up to me and he's like, hey, do you want to buy a $5,000 ship? I'm like, what? <laughs> he's like, an NFT. It's, you know, this new project and they're um, selling these NFT ships online. And um, I'm like, mate, it's like any other NFT project <laughs> at the time. I was skeptical of it. And then I started looking into it and I, start, I heard a few talks by Wagner, the CEO, and, you know, the vision of it really captured me. You know, so although the initial hype and excitement around, well, look at these ships that they're selling on the market, I then actually looked into the project and I looked at the vision and they talked a lot about developing this nation state, this alternate economy where individuals can participate in a very fun gaming environment built on top of Solana, which is quite innovative, and they can participate in missions and resource gathering. And the whole thing just started to get really deep and really complex. And that's what I really love. And then there was the law side of it. So they had a whole law building team that were writing all of the law behind it. And then as I started getting more and more interested in it, I realized that there was a huge market in developing countries. You know, I saw a huge market in countries that were experiencing hyperinflation and experiencing local economics that were not ideal to them um, and could see Star Atlas as a way of actually earning income and, you know, an alternate way of living their life. And whilst participating in a fun and exciting game, also solving the problem of being able to generate income and be able to live effectively. So, um you know, the initial, I guess, hype and excitement then turned into interest and then it just built into, well, I want to be a part of this and just built, started building and started developing everything that I could from a data and analytics perspective to expose to everybody what was going on and really just share the passion and the vision. Yeah, well, and that's a really interesting concept. We were talking a little bit about it before the call as well, is the concept of like a, a nation state that is a place where people can derive income from that is not subject to the local conditions that the geography that they find themselves in and, you know, corrupt government or whatever it might be, not many job opportunities. So maybe talk a bit about that. Like why, is that something that you think is going to take off? Is Star Atlas maybe a nation state in and of itself, but, or is it part of this bigger sort of nation state maybe called the metaverse or Solana or, I mean, the biggest ones, probably the internet in general. But like, what do you think is is the end goal? Are we all going to be Ready Player One with VR headsets, like sitting in a van? Or like, how does it, how does it go, do you reckon? Look, I think a lot of it um, is based around the current way that nation states perform. You know, if you think about what a nation state is, it's an economy, it has a workforce, it has citizenship. So essentially the way you define a citizen or a nation, there's global standards around that. So one of the interesting things about Star Atlas is they've hired a really top-notch economics team. And that economics team, you know, come from, you know, very traditional sort of economics background, but they're taking the same concepts and ideas and they're applying it to the Web3 sort of space. So the daily state of economy reports and the quarterly reports that they release and the papers that they're releasing are really setting the scene for this kind of I wouldn't call it a new paradigm. It's borrowing old concepts, but it's applying them to the metaverse and it's applying them to Web3. So I do see, in answer to your question, you know, a lot of other projects that are going to follow suit, that are going to take these ideas and they're going to apply them to their own projects. I'm not sure about the VR thing, the full immersive space, but 
I think definitely, you know, it's at a stage where we're seeing a lot of academics start to get interested in it. So PhD students, individuals which have come from more of the traditional economics world, now looking at Web3 and looking at the Web3 economy and looking at particularly the gaming space like Star Atlas and seeing, well, you know, there's opportunity here for people to build a career. And in building a career, you know, they're generating wages and, you know, they're driving an alternative economy, which isn't based on their geophysical area. It's something different. It transcends that. So I think we're kind of pretty early on, um, but I think there's a lot of pioneering going on and it's not creating something new. It's essentially building on top of what we've already got. Absolutely. And, and so every any nation state needs workers doing things, right? And what are the workers or the people going to be doing in this nation state? Like, is it something that's sustainable? Because one of the, I guess, uh, opposite sides of the Web3 gaming uh, perspective is, oh, well, it's just a game. So is it a sustainable long-term thing or is there just a million other games out there that can do a similar thing? What's your take on the long-term sort of viability of this, this alternate nation state? Look, I think there's different career pathways. That's the fun and interesting part about something like Star Atlas. So the way they're building the game is you don't have to be a one-trick pony, you know, so... In traditional gaming, you know, you've got your fighting. So, I mean, you can obviously buy a ship and you can fight against others. You can be part of a pirate guild. Um, You can be part of a services um, aspect within Star Atlas. So, you know, running a shop and selling goods and services like a traditional man. You can be a miner. So you can go and discover planets and you can find resources and you can sell them in the market. You can be a trader and you can buy and sell. You can do what I do, which is data running. And that's, you know, collecting information, collecting data off the blockchain, and then providing that to the various guilds to help them make smarter, faster, better decisions. So there's all these different career pathways that you can think of. So the workforce then becomes similar to a traditional nation state where you've got people doing what they love and what they're good at and developing their skills down a particular stream. And that just becomes a really vibrant and, you know, Um, really diverse economy. So I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for different individuals. For me, one of the things that really attracted me early was I was doing a lot of volunteer work in the disability sector. So I was working with a lot of people with muscular dystrophy, people that were wheelchair bound. And I was thinking to myself, well, they don't have the opportunity to work in a traditional job. But imagine in the metaverse, imagine they can essentially participate in an economy which doesn't require them to physically have to go and do something. There's a whole, um, you know, there's millions of people out there in the world that are looking for an opportunity like that. So I think there's a lot of different career pathways. The other interesting thing to note is that a nation state isn't just about the workforce. There's also citizens. And the interesting thing about Star Atlas is it's introduced this idea of a decentralized autonomous organization it's got, you know, a voting system, it's got a governance token, which in staking that governance token, you get voting rights in terms of the direction of the game. So there's a political element in there as well. And I think that's important to consider. Absolutely. That's a good point. And about the, you know, the, the workforce and different productive things that people do, maybe you can talk us through the challenges of building in this new world, right? Like you yourself, you, as you said, wanted to expose that data to to everyone, right? Like to have accessibility to what's going on in the Star Atlas ecosystem. So what are the challenges maybe in Solana potentially, or or maybe just Web3 in general that, that you ran into? Because I know like Stardust Economy has been around for probably, what, a year or year and a half, two years maybe now, something like that. It's been around for a while at least. And it wasn't perhaps as fully fleshed out in the beginning on, on day one. So what's been the builder's journey, you know, going through through building a real product uh, since, since day one? It's a bit hard, man. It's hard in the blockchain space because you're dealing with a completely different paradigm, a different form of data, different infrastructure. And you don't have the traditional applications to leverage. You can't leverage traditional systems. You've got to kind of build it yourself. So 
an example I use is with Solana data itself. Like, how do you um, query the Solana blockchain to extract information from the various contracts? It's very different to traditional data analytics where you have a really nice, clean database that's set up with all of these, you know, lovely labeled variables and you can just write some SQL code and away you go. You've got, you know, the answer to the questions you're asking with Solana. It's sort of like you've got to build all of that infrastructure yourself. You've got to index all of the tables. You, you know, you've, you've got to go through this process of figuring out what's within, you know, the different um, components of a blockchain transaction and pull out all the information you need. So in the early days of Stardust economy, I was just spending a lot of time like trying to build a basic sort of data pipeline that was something automated and repeatable. And that took a long time to build. Thankfully, now there's a lot of applications out there like Flipside Query and other sort of applications that people have built where they've indexed the Solana blockchain and they're making it easier for, you know, builders. But in the early days, we were doing that ourselves and there was a lot of challenges there now. So I think for me, I take an approach where I like to get a lot of feedback on the things I'm building. Obviously, I think they're interesting. I publish them. I seek feedback from the community. Is this something that's going to help you? Is this something that's valuable? And I get a lot of that feedback and then I just continue iterating. So I use a very agile sort of process in terms of how I've developed things. So I think to your point, in the early days, I didn't know what I was building. Now I'm actually quite clear in terms of what I offer to the market. And now it's just about continually adding value to the community that we've built and developed. That's it. And you know, a good point that I just thought there is one of the things nation states did a couple of hundred years ago was standardized weights and measures. Like I, I think it was, well, the French came up with the kilogram and centimeters and all that sort of thing. But when they did, it was necessary and, and it proliferated throughout the, the rest of, of the European countries at the time because everyone agreed that there was a lot of lost productivity using different standards for things. And, and one of the things, I guess, with Solana back in the day is everyone building their own stuff there is no standard way to do things, right? There is no common way to query a contract on chain. Now we have things like Anchor and, and other stuff as well. Uh, as you said, some of these other platforms that are providing APIs for people to use and builders. So I guess the, the, the question as well is for builders now, what should they be thinking about when they're coming up with, with a new product or, or, or if, they, if they see something? Like at Stardust, you saw that there was a need and, and you went and built it. It is, is that obviously still the, the go-to or should they perhaps get some experience elsewhere or how should they think about getting involved as a full-time sort of role in this ecosystem? I think to start with, people need to pick something they're passionate about. You know, for me, it was Star Atlas. Um, I believe in the project to the lines with my values and my vision. So every minute I spend on the data and developing things is true to myself. I think that's the first thing people need to do. The second thing, people need to align to projects with individuals that they enjoy being around and that, you know, are supportive of them as well. So I think it starts a lot around that. So identify projects where you believe in the founders and you believe in, you know, the leaders and the people that are working in there and you want to surround yourself around those people. And then I think what people need to also do is challenge traditional thinking. You know, for me, as a data scientist, I came into the Web3 world and I wanted to apply all of my centralized analytics skills to a decentralized space. And I made a lot of mistakes early trying to silo all the data and build, you know, separate databases and systems, which actually went against the ethos of Web3 and blockchain. So I think where possible, people need to push themselves a little bit and, you know, really understand what is Web3 what is the decentralized space? How is it different to the traditional areas that they're developing in? And ensure that their product meets that integrity check at the end of the day. You don't want to go and just create another centralized application. You want to, where possible, leverage the decentralized world, leverage what's being built, and use that to build your core product. I think those things, those kind of three or four pieces of advice, I think will really set people up. And the last thing is we have an awesome community. 
you know, like the Discord servers, like that you join, whether it's Star Atlas, whether it's other projects. There's a r- lot of really knowledgeable people out there. So get yourself out there and, you know, communicate, build a network. You, people will give you advice. Like I'm here to give people advice. You're here to give people advice. And, you know, we may not know everything, but we definitely are here and we're passionate and we're trying to push things forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And look, the one of the cool things I really liked about Star uh, Stardust was you had a lot of unique metrics as well that were very relevant, I think, at the time, like the APY for staking, you know, spaceships and, and stuff like that. That was very cool. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of other stuff now as well. Uh, maybe what's your plans going forward on the product side with Stardust? And we can get into, you know, the Academy and, and some of the other cool things. But uh, yeah, is, is there sort of movements? Are you changing the way that you're building data structures? Like, and as well, maybe a side question before I forget, um, should people be building open source things as well? Or like, should it be in conjunction with a governance thing from a community? Like, hey, I want to build this. Can you give me some funds to build it or something like that? Like how, how, sh- how can people get into it, I guess, as well? Yeah, so lots of good questions there. I think uh, probably to start with your first question around the direction for the Stardust Economy product. A lot of what I'm doing is actually uplifting the data science and the algorithmic side of what I do. So there's a lot of machine learning going on behind the scenes. There's a lot of forecasting happening. I'm playing around with a lot of, um, you know, sort of more econometric type capabilities. So I always like to say people are obsessed with business intelligence and analytics, but a lot of that world is like driving your car in the rear view mirror. You see all these charts and lines and they look pretty and they're really nice and they show you what's happened. True, the direction, but it's the past. <laughs> that's the past, yeah. So for me, the direction is looking more into the future. So you'll start to notice when you come on my website, I have forecasting objects that predict things You know, a week ahead of time you'll start to see more of the machine learning elements coming in. I'm doing like weird and wacky stuff around consuming massive amounts of text data. So like social media data, the economic quarterly reports and using like more of the like chat GPT type capabilities to summarize content. So a lot of cool stuff happening there. Um, And I'm just going to keep, you know, working that angle, that predictive angle, that let's not drive our car in the rear view mirror, let's try and be proactive around what's happening. Um, The Star Atlas world is changing as well. I don't know if you saw, but Escape Velocity was released. It's the first super scale movement test on the Solana blockchain. That brings a whole new element into the Star Atlas ecosystem, new data. So we've got grids now, so we can see people moving around on the blockchain. So you can imagine all these weird and funky analytics around like, optimization, traveling salesman, like all of that funky stuff is happening. So I've got that's all these That's crazy, ideas. man. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And that's all on the blockchain. So it's all publicly available information. You can see players moving around the grid and picking up loot. And this is starting to build. So tell us about that. Like, so you can see where players are and what they're doing, right? And you can, that's all available on chain. Yeah, and we're talking about like millions of transactions that are going on in Solana with, you know, people using different strategies where they've got like 50 ships in a line and they're moving across the grid, scanning each of the different grid squares. And then you've got people that are um, coming together as a guild and they're occupying a whole bottom corner of the grid to try and pick up rare loot. And so I've got all this data and I'm seeing how players are moving around and this is starting to form the beginning stages of what is going to be this intergalactic um, journey of Star Atlas. So the product is um, getting more and more interesting as new data comes in. Yeah, that's that's super cool. I, I guess the point is that these things, they need to be focused on having a Web3 angle to building. Well, I guess there's two schools of thought, right? There's, hey, you need a really fun and interesting game because only that's what people will care about and use. But then also the game needs to be fundamentally entrenched somehow in Web3 and crypto. Otherwise, what's the point? Like you don't want to just be adding a wallet onto your game for no reason and it adds no value and it's just sort of a nonsense thing, right? So I guess there's a balance to be striking there. And 
is there an, I don't know if there's an answer to that. It's like, where do you think people should fall or, you know, where do you think they should aim towards when building a game? It's kind of like, you kind of need everything, right? <laughs> but it's a big ask. Right. You know, like Star Atlas at the moment has this escape velocity. So they've got the grid and they've got the warping. And so, you know, you can warp from one square to another square. That's all on the blockchain. But then when you scan a square to look for loot, that's all on the back end. So that doesn't show up on the blockchain. So they're kind of testing all these new concepts out. So they're releasing escape velocity. They're building certain things on the blockchain and then they're building certain things in the back end. And, you know, there's going to be this trade-off where does everything really need to be decentralized or do only these elements need to be decentralized? So I think, you know, one of your questions I didn't answer before was, well, where should people be focusing and where are the opportunities? And I think it's in that realm of, you know, let's be sensible about the things that we build and where does decentralization really help? Where does it hinder? Um, and how do we find that balance? So, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for people to make smart new applications that get the best of both worlds. Yeah, actually, I just tweeted on that point. Like, what is sufficiently decentralized? What does that mean? Is that like a thousand people that are potentially, you know, not able to control something? Is it a billion? Is it 10 hundred billion, million trillion? Like, is what's it the, next the actual? Billion? Is it yeah, the is, next it the next, <laughs> is it the next billion? <laughs> um, yeah, and I think there is a trade off there. And you've got to be cognizant that sometimes if you're leaning too hard to one side, you, you don't actually get the benefit. So it's all about like bang for buck. And I guess, sort of optimizing there. But maybe we can also talk about some of the initiatives that you're looking to do to bring more builders into the space as well. You're starting a, a data academy, right? Like, tell us about that. What's going on there? Yeah, so I love the idea of data running. And in Star Atlas, it's like this career pathway where even some of the ships actually have scanners and data running capability. So they're setting well, what it up. Is, so that, so, sorry, what is data running? What are you specifically talking about there? Anything to do with data, anything to do with information. I mean, so con if you consuming transactions on chain and putting it in a deba database somewhere, something like that, right? Yeah, coming up with smart metrics that measure, you know, things like APY you mentioned earlier. So data runners essentially build these smart consoles that give you a window into what's going on and help you make decisions, optimize decisions. So building decision supports, being able to, you know, find, for instance, in Star Atlas, there's going to be certain planets with certain resources on them. How do you know where to find those planets? Well, you go to your local data runner and they give you some really good ideas as to where a lot of the good resources might be. So trading information and that side of things. So data running is a really sort of interesting, exciting sort of career pathway that I've identified. I mean, if you look at analytics and data science traditionally, it's a very, very appealing career pathway for a lot of people, even in the traditional world. So blending that data science, data analytics world with Web3, promoting this idea of data running. So developing skills in being able to take traditional data science, applying it to the blockchain space, and then uplifting that literacy, it all just kind of came together. And I'm like, you know what? I've got all this experience and I've got all this knowledge. And I learn off other people all the time as well. So why don't I create like an academy? Why don't I help people go from the very beginning? So lesson one, let's talk about data literacy. Let's talk about how do you retrieve data? How do you query data? You know, how do you um, use Python? How do you start to actually develop your own skills in information literacy so that you can start using those skills in whatever you do? So the Data Running Academy is, you know, really something that is giving back to the community. And what I'm hoping it will do is it will create a group of in cohorts that will go through the academy. Some might even come back and teach some of the lectures. And it will build this whole community of analytically literate individuals that will then go off into other projects and boost the whole ecosystem. So you'll start to see, you know, really, really good analytics people in various other projects as well that we see today. That's super cool. So is this content that is going to be provided? Is there a website? Is it video? Is it written? How do you, how do you want to deliver this? And can people sign up? Like, how do we, how do we get involved? 
Yeah, so I'm going to be announcing the launch in the next sort of couple of weeks. I've already built the portal. So I've built a web portal with all of the curriculum content. It's going to be um, a mixture of, you know, sort of pre-recorded seminars as well as sort of, you know, a sandbox environment. So people setting up, you know, a Python Jupyter notebook and setting up their flip side query environment and then having all their infrastructure ready and then sort of going through structured learning courses. So I'll definitely keep everyone posted on Twitter in the next sort of two weeks as we ramp up to the first release. And then I'm basically going to just get people to apply to join the Data Running Academy. I'll probably have, you know, a cap of, say, 100 for the first cohort. They'll go through the first curriculum, give feedback, and then we'll just keep iterating through it and we'll keep pushing people through the curriculum. And it'll hopefully over time, it'll just get better and better and more successful. And, you know, people will benefit from it. We need to do something here with uh, some of the stuff that we're doing as well at STEP, I think. We got uh, Slanner All Stars, you know, in person IRL events where we're talking to a bunch of different people in different cities all over the world, educational content, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, we need to direct them towards uh, towards the Data Running Academy. I think that'd be that'd be awesome. And as well, yeah, like, hey, awesome. anyone from Solana out there as well? There's awesome people that uh, may be looking for grants and that sort of thing. So, FYI. But uh, look, I think I th- I think this is a, a really good thing, and and you can get. A lot of like a hundred people upskilled into being able to add value in on-chain markets and that sort of thing. Like this is a very rare skill as well. And especially if people are able to to get good at this, like you can definitely make a job out of it for the rest of your life. I had someone the other day. I had someone in the Star Atlas community that just like reached out to me and they're like, Hey, I can see the stuff that you're doing. I don't know how to use Python. I don't know yet how to use Flipside. I don't know how to get data off Solana. Like, can you help me? And literally had like a 40 minute session with this guy from Germany. And um, within 40 minutes, like I had him set up on Flipside. I had him building his own queries with a live API feed that then fed into his Python Jupyter notebook. And then I set him up with some basic queries in Python. And now he's like playing around with, you know, forecasting and some of the smart stuff. And like, you don't need to do a three year data science master's degree to be an analytics person, to be a data runner. You just need to be passionate and curious. You need to get some of the secret sauce sprinkled in and you can be up and running very quickly. Wow. That's amazing. That's a good story. And I think it comes back to building products and being involved in these communities where you think that uh, whatever you build is going to have value, right? And in the Star Atlas community, there's going to be so much different on-chain stuff happening. I mean, and that's just one community, right? There's tons of them. So wherever you might be, I I think that this online nation state is going to continue to to be there and there's going to be new things popping up here and there. Uh, So maybe as well, just to sort of cap it off, like where should people go to find out more? We got Stardust Economy. We got the uh, the Academy starting soon. I assume that'll be on the Twitter and that sort of thing. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, where should they go? Definitely reach out to me on Twitter. I'm most active on Twitter, so you can just sort of DM me there. You'll see me cruising around the Star Atlas Discord. Um, I tend to sit in the economics channel. That's the channel that I'm most interested in. So you can definitely reach out to me on Discord. I've even got a chat thing on my website. So if you're really desperate and you don't use Twitter and Discord or any of those things, you can just leave me a chat on my website at the bottom corner. And I'm generally pretty receptive to that too. So yeah, I think I'm pretty available most of the time. Amazing. And to cap it off, what are you looking forward to 2023? We're almost halfway through now. I don't know how that happened, but halfway through (laughs) 2023, what are you excited about uh, getting out there? It's a good question. I mean, I just got married, so I probably decided without being married. Congratulations, and... by the way. Very good. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks. I'm definitely excited about that. I'm excited for a lot of the the projects which have really been hanging on and building. Like, I mean, no question we've been in a bear market. You know, things have been crab walking for quite a while now. People, you know, I'm seeing around me get a little bit frustrated and a little bit impatient, but as you mentioned, one of the OGs, I've seen many cycles and I'm really excited for as we start hitting the back end of 2023, seeing the market change 
and you know start to generate some of that hype again and the world being ready for the technology that people are building and people are busy with so i think the general market's going to be exciting towards the back end of 2023 i think for projects like star atlas it's just going to keep building i'm really excited to see you know as escape velocity and sage start to come out um, some of the new features and you know the new game loops that are being created and then I'm really, really excited to see this whole Web3 economics thing start to flourish. And I want to see other projects doing what the Star Atlas economics team are doing. And I'm hoping that happens towards the back end of this year as well. So they're probably my three most exciting elements that I'm looking forward to. I love it. And the focus on the economics there is super important. I mean, we know gaming in general, it's a how many tens, hundreds of billion dollar industry. It keeps going up. It keeps reaching more people. So it definitely is a thing. And it's like, imagine if, you know, that gets onto this, this separate nation state. Well, look, thank you so much for your time today, Stardust. It's been a pleasure. We'll put any of the links in the description there. Definitely go and check them out. Check out the Data Academy as well. This guy is one of the OGs that's, uh, that's been building since uh, Solana really sort of kicked off. So uh, look, thank you so much for the work that you do and have a great rest of the day. And also, by the way, I should note before we go, I messaged him last week and he was saying, hey, I'm on a honeymoon. I can't really do it right now. So literally as soon as he came back, he was uh, ready to go on the podcast. So got to thank you for for doing that as well and, uh, you know, getting back into it. So uh, all the best there. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks, George. And thanks everyone for listening. Really appreciate it. See ya.